The ancient Greeks were famous for their deep thinking, not really for lifting weights. But they believed that having a smart brain also meant having a strong body, and they worked hard on both. Their gyms were pretty basic, think open fields next to a river rather than rooms full of equipment. They didn't have treadmills or dumbbells, just whatever was lying around, like big rocks. And for the real tough guys, they might even lift a bowl. Yeah, more on that later. Another thing they didn't have? Workout clothes. The Greeks did their fitness routines in their birthday suits, believing that's how the gods preferred it. The word gym actually comes from the Greek word gymnos, which means naked. Back then, gyms were all about getting better at combat stuff, like wrestling and sprinting, so fancy gear wasn't part of the equation. Back in ancient Greece, with all its different city-states doing their own thing, it made sense that each place had its own spot for training. These early gyms started simple but got fancier as time went by, especially as sports became a big deal. Athletes in these competitions were in the buff too, but they'd jazz things up with a good slathering of oil, supposedly for sun protection. We can guess there were other reasons for the oil up. Oh, and married women had to sit these events out. This exclusion wasn't just about modesty or the revealing nature of athletes competing in the nude. It was deeply rooted in the societal norms and gender roles of the time. The Greeks believed that athletic competitions were a celebration of physical prowess and beauty, realms they considered squarely in the male domain. These events were more than just sports, they were rituals of strength, discipline, and virtue, embodying ideals that were seen as exclusively masculine. These sports festivals were the talk of the town, attracting crowds in the tens of thousands. The Olympics were the headline act, but there were three other big games too, all cycling every four years. These games created a class of superstar athletes who trained like their lives depended on it. Winning meant more than just a leafy crown. It meant hometown hero status, complete with statues and sometimes even a political career. Take Milo of Croton, for instance. This guy found a calf and, for some reason, decided to lug it around daily. This wasn't just a short-term gig, he kept at it until that calf was a full-grown bull, which he then celebrated by eating the poor thing in a single day. Milo wasn't just showing off, he crushed it at the Pan-Hellenic Games, snagging the Grand Slam by winning all four festivals in a cycle, and he did this five times. For over two decades, Milo was the rock star of ancient Greek athletics. He also was the father of the progressive overload training principle that is the foundation of any training program in any kind of sport. Back in ancient times, pros like Milo bulked out by eating lots of meat and focusing on one skill exclusively. But the average Joe of ancient Greece took a more all-rounder approach at the gym. Being fit wasn't just about looking good, it was about being ready for battle. They weren't trying to be the best at just one thing, because on the battlefield, being a one-trick pony could get you in big trouble. So the young dudes, and they were mostly dudes hitting the gyms, were training to be warriors, needing a good mix of strength, speed, and agility. Being just okay in one area wasn't a deal breaker, but there were always a few who took it easy, much to the dismay of thinkers like Socrates. One day, Socrates, just chilling outside the gym, spots a young guy strolling by looking like he's never lifted anything heavier than a scroll. Socrates, being Socrates, doesn't miss a beat and starts giving the guy a hard time for not being in shape. The young guy's like, chill, Socrates, I'm no Olympian. But Socrates fires back, saying it's everyone's duty to be fit and ready for action. Makes you wonder, though, what Socrates himself was doing hanging around gyms if he was so big on training. Anyways, turns out Greek gyms were the ancient equivalent of a community center. They were all about the mind-body connection blending fitness with learning. That's why these places weren't just for sweating it out, they became hubs of social life and intellectual debate. In fact, they got so fancy that cities competed to have the most impressive gymnasiums. Even Plato and Aristotle, two big-shot thinkers, set up their schools and gyms. Plato was also a wrestler who earned the nickname Plato, meaning broad, derived from his broad shoulders and his wrestling style. He also stressed combining mental acuity with physical strength, claiming, he who is only an athlete is too crude, too vulgar, too much a savage. He who is a scholar only is too soft, too effeminate. The ideal citizen is the scholar-athlete, the man of thought and the man of action. Plato established his school known as the Academy in a grove near the gymnasium of Academos just outside Athens. This wasn't just a random location choice, it was a deliberate decision that reflected Plato's belief in the importance of physical fitness as part of a well-rounded education. 
embodying the Greek ideal of a sound mind in a sound body. Aristotle, Plato's most famous student, later founded his own school, the Lyceum, also near a gymnasium. The Lyceum, much like the academy, served as a center for learning where intellectual discussions were complemented with physical training. Aristotle took his students on walks as they discussed various topics, believing that movement facilitated thinking and learning. This practice even earned Aristotle and his followers the nickname peripatetics from the Greek word peripatein, meaning to walk about. From their simple start, the Greeks developed a sophisticated training system and gave birth to a type of coach called the Pidotrize, the OG personal trainers. These folks were the go-to for everything gym-related, from workouts to helping athletes recover and eat right. Their job changed a bit over time, but they stayed key players all the way into the Roman era, even helping to shape the next wave of Athenian warriors. The classical period introduced us to two new kinds of trainers. The Zistarchies, who got athletes ready for big competitions like the Olympics, and the Eliopdes, who were basically ancient nutrition gurus. Also, gyms started to get fancy with the addition of baths and changing rooms. Sounds pretty basic now, but back then, these features were a big deal, influencing not just fitness routines, but also public life. Based on what's available, the ancient Greeks were savvy about not rushing the training process. Plato mentioned that if someone wanted to get physically stronger, they needed to invest a lot of personal time to figure out which exercises worked best for them. Aristotle chimed in, saying it was crucial for trainers to be hands-on, helping to pinpoint which workouts were best for different body types. They'd also oversee diet plans and offer guidance in various exercises like running and wrestling. As for the science of sports back then, we know from texts attributed to Hippocrates and others that pushing your strength too far could be risky. They believed that hitting your peak strength required a temporary step back to allow the body to refresh and rebuild. This early understanding of muscle building and the necessity of rest days led to the development of what was known as the Tetrid routine. Understanding muscle growth and rest was a big deal back then, so their training plans were based on this. Evidence suggests this training regimen was standard during Athens's golden days. Athletes following this program trained on a four-day rotation. Day one focused on intense brief exercises. Day two dialed it back, incorporating more mobility work and perhaps some philosophical discussions. The third day ramped up the intensity, focusing on rigorous training specific to the athlete's specialty. The cycle would conclude on the fourth day with a focus on recovery, which included massages, baths, and relaxation. Plato mentioned that trainers would blend dancing with wrestling to create well-rounded athletes, boasting both strength and agility. Moreover, the Greeks practiced a variety of exercises including shadow boxing, punching bag drills, running, horseback riding, swimming, and grappling, demonstrating a broad and diverse approach to physical training. So the gym wasn't just about getting ripped, it was the OG spot for brain gains too. This combo is what sparked the whole Greek genius for deep thoughts and philosophies we're all about today. I'll be taking donations in the form of likes and subscribes. Catch you on the next one.